how do you end up in America? And, and what led you, I suppose, is the question, to being the man who found or described multifocal motor neuropathy? Well, going to America was actually quite unusual at the time that I went, the, the, because we were still stuck to Mother Britain, and the vast majority of my colleagues went to the UK to study. But a, a New Zealander who I had met at our medical school 100th reunion, uh, 100th anniversary se celebrations, uh, was in the United States and had also studied in uh, the UK. And he compared and contrasted the two places and, and said that he recommended I go to the United States and, and in a way I think he was right because I don't think I would have done well in the British system. It's too structured and regimented. Well, it's not so much structured, it's regimented. I mean, yeah. the boss is very much the boss. Mm -hmm. You can't question the boss. You can't uh, get involved in discussions and you can't think freely. Uh, so so I, I chose to go to uh, the US and but certainly don't regret it. Uh, the discovery of MMN, I think, was an offshoot of that because when I discovered it, it was so controversial that I think in the UK I would have been beaten down by the senior people because I, I was told many times that this was just, it couldn't be, it was an artifact, yeah. I, I was making it all up. Um, and it took me a long time to get my work published. Um, and. Uh, the early cases mostly had been misconstrued um, as having motor neuron disease, ALS, a terrible disease. And, and this young man I saw, he was only 23 at the time, and I thought, well, that's a bit young for motor neuron disease. Of course, it happens. But he had one little feature that really puzzled me. Uh, when you get motor neuron disease, if you get weak, it's because the, the nerve cells are lost. Right. And when the nerve cells are lost, the muscle shrinks away. And so, as you know, um, when the muscle, when you, you have nerve damage, the muscle shrinks away. Yeah. But in the very early stages um, of MMN, the muscle doesn't shrink. And so I saw this young man, the thing that really started the process of, of challenging my own thinking mm -hmm. was that he had a muscle that was very weak, that still wasn't atrophy, that still hadn't shrunk away. I thought, that's pretty unusual. So I then did nerve conductions to that muscle yeah. and found this, uh, this characteristic abnormality called conduction block where you stimulate the nerve near the wrist and you get a big um, large amplitude response and you stimulate the nerve farther upstream and you get this very small amplitude response where some of the impulses are not getting through. And that's absolutely not a feature of motor neuron disease. And, you know, as often happens, um, I got another case quite quickly thereafter. I mean, it's, you're, you wonder about these coincidences. Yeah. Um, but, but anyway, I, I began thinking, I thought this was a horrendously rare phenomenon, but I thought it was interesting. And mm -hmm. uh, we collected up a small group of patients through putting it around the community um, and then described this condition that we called multifocal acquired demyelinating neuropathy. <laughs> it's worse than MMA. Yeah, exactly. So, so um, and yeah, it, it took a while, but eventually it was accepted as a unique entity. And, uh, almost simultaneously, um, a colleague of mine, Alan Pestronk, who was at that time at, at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, uh, had also seen a couple of cases. And so he, he described it independently, but later than I did, so yeah. I, I get the credit. You get the credit. That's all right. It's always good to be first. And, uh, and he's the one who called it multifocal motor neuropathy. You know, and why, why is that so unusual? Well, nerves contain motor and sensory axons. Yeah. A and at that time, it, it just wasn't thought that you could get something that would attack the peripheral nerve and only affect the motor axons. It, it, doesn't, it just didn't seem logical. Um, and all the conditions we knew, like CIDP and GBS, 
were conditions that were motor predominant, but certainly didn't spare the sensory axons. Uh, so that that's so. Why is that? Then? What uh, what is it that that is different? I guess? So, so you're interested in supporting research, um, and and that I think I think is the big research question. We the answer is we don't really know. And if I may sort of deviate a little bit, there's in, in GBS, the much more common disease that we talked about, there's a form of GBS called acute motor axonal neuropathy, or AMAN. Yeah. And the evidence is accumulating that that also is a nodoparanodopathy. That is, it is, um, it is a disease in which the attack is primarily directed at the node of Rombier, the little gap in the myelin sheath that, that regenerates the current. Um, and I sort of think of AMAN as being the acute form of MMN. Now, you can't take the analogy too far, right. because MMN is unique also by virtue of the fact that it's strikingly patchy. You'll get one nerve here and one nerve there, and Amen is not like that. So, so you don't want to take the analogy too far, but from a pathological perspective, it, it, it may be relevant. And we also know that there's a condition called AMSAN, which is acute motor and sensory axonal neuropathy. Yeah. And the evidence is that AMSAN is just a particularly severe form of Amen. so that if there is a, a vigorous enough attack on the nerve, it's not restricted to the motor um, nodes of Rombier and spills over and affects sensory nerves as well. And we know also in MMN, after many years, they get a few mild, mild sensory problems. It's subtle, it's never clinically significant. You can find it. So, so I think of uh, MMN as being the chronic version of AMAN. Doesn't answer your question. No. Right? It's why. What is it about the a node of Rovier of motor axons that make them susceptible to an attack in either condition, uh, whereas sensory are uh, somewhat spared. And we don't know the answer to that. That's a, a huge need for research. And we don't presumably know, you know what, it, what is it that's causing. So these acute, the GBS, the AMANs, from what I've read, there's a, the... Um, and we've talked about previously, there's increasing evidence to suggest there's a, there's a clear cause um, that can be attributed to some sort of infection and overstimulation of the immune system, for want of a better phrase. Um, yeah, but the phenomenon of molecular mimicry, if, if the yeah. immune system is activated by any trigger, and as you say, it's usually an infection or a vaccination or something that we specifically uh, try, we, we can specifically identify. But if it's an acute disease, the, the, the neurological event follows hard on the feel, heel. Oh, it's time sensitive. And, and, and so we recognize it. Yeah. Whereas if, if you've got a chronic, slowly evolving disease, there might have been a trigger five years ago, but you've forgotten it by now. Um, so, so it may also be the process of molecular mimicry. The early cases of MMN um, often had histories of 10 or more years before they f were finally diagnosed. Um, we hope they get diagnosed a little earlier these days, uh, but even so, there's still big delays in diagnosis. So then trying to identify a common trigger um, or common even a group of triggers is going to be uh, really extraordinarily difficult because people just don't remember. Uh, no. They adapt, they get on with their lives, and it's only when the disability exceeds their ability to compensate that they say, I better get off to the doctor. And sometimes it's our spouse who wisely says, get off to the doctor. <laughs> this isn't right. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, so I think that's going to be a, an extremely challenging task to try to find if there is some common trigger. Yeah. Uh, and I guess then, I mean, I guess the question, then the question naturally then becomes, if there is a common trigger, what can you do about it anyway? Particularly if it's a 
some sort of common or garden infection. Yeah. Um, well, see, it, it, so it, it, um, it, if there is a trigger, um, it is most likely to be something non-specific. Uh, so the, let's look at infections as potential triggers. Uh, we know that with GBS, the infection is sometimes with this organism called uh, causing gastroenteritis called Campylobacter jejuni. Um, uh, but sometimes it's a virus called cytomegalovirus. Sometimes it's a virus called Epstein-Barr virus. Um, so, so there are multiple different infections yeah. that can trigger the process that leads to this immune attack. And we talked about stimulating the immune system. It uh, attacks the invader, let's say Campylobacter jejuni, and then there's this spillover effect due to molecular mimicry. But is that the case with other diseases? The answer is we don't know. GBS is such a dramatic event that people often, and in fact, in fact, sometimes too often, recall an event that they demand is, tri is the trigger for their yeah. disease, but probably isn't. Um, because they want human beings want an explanation. They they don't deal well with uncertainty. So it's somehow emotionally easier to say, "Oh, I got this, and this happened. Therefore, this well, was cool." So effectively, something is stimulating your immune system to attack. That that then, for whatever reason, it's misseeing parts of your, you know, your normal nerve nervous system as a foreign. Entity that should be dealt with. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. and uh, so, so I think that. But but you're right that if you if you're really looking at therapeutics and and obviously we want to study we want to understand this disease better so that we can come up with a more effective treatment. Um, but it probably isn't going to make any difference what the trigger was well, in terms yeah. of coming so up with that. Yeah. So it's it's. It's a kind of academic nicety, yeah. but it's not necessarily going to make a difference. Yeah. It won't, won't, unless it was a man-made thing, and you, you know, you, but you aren't going to change the outcome. Right, and so, so the focus, it, it seems to me, and I think we talked about this uh, recently, that I think the focus needs to be understanding the molecular processes that are occurring at the node of Ranvier. And I think that's where we need to be focusing research because the better we understand those processes, the more likely it is that we're going to be able to come up with more effective treatment. Does it tend to normally be the, the hands first? Yeah, or... it's, so, so neuropathies in general almost always affect the feet first and then the legs and then the hands and then the thighs and then the forearms and so on, so that they ascend. Um, and it's always been a puzzle about MMN, one of the many puzzles about <laughs> this disease. Why does it have such a predilection for the nerves of the upper limbs? It does affect the lower mm. limbs, definitely, but, but it really has this predilection for not just nerves of the upper limbs, but specifically the median nerve and the ulnar nerve. Yes, the radial nerve can be affected, no question about that. But it, it's unusual. It's a very unusual distribution that we see. Again, so, another mystery. So the most common symptoms lot that you likely see first are, are hands and arms. Correct. And so, you know, you talked about electrical conduction treatment, but if, if someone turns up, what, what's the kind of process you go through to try and diagnose someone who walks into the surgery with that kind of condition? Well, I think that anybody who presents with any peripheral nerve problem, so that is something that affects the nerves outside the brain and spinal cord. Yeah. Uh, I personally think the first step in evaluating those patients is electrical testing. Now, do I think every single patient with a neuropathy needs electrical testing? Well, if you've got a person who's had diabetes for 40 years and hasn't been well controlled and has got a little numbness and tingling in their feet, the, the They've got a diabetic neuropathy, yeah. and you don't mm -hmm. need to worry about it too much. But but unless it is glaringly obvious, I think the point that you start is to get the patient in and do the electrical testing. Now, patients don't like it that much because it's uncomfortable, as you know. Um, but I think it is critical to understanding the process, and very often. Uh, we end up saying, well, it's just diabetic neuropathy or it's just yeah. alcoholic neuropathy or whatever. Um, but, but 
until you've got that electrical testing, you can't be sure. And only a minority of neuropathies are treatable, but I think that increases your responsibility to, to diagnose those and to diagnose them uh, in a timely fashion. Because the other thing about neuropathies, and no matter what they are, whether they're toxic or metabolic or autoimmune, the opportunity for successful treatment uh, is early. Right. Uh, and so CIDP, which is our re related disorder, another autoimmune neuropathy, um, the Dutch studies have shown that if you don't get started on treatment within two years, the chance of you responding satisfactorily to treatment is very small. Okay. So, so yeah, so you see a patient with neuropathy. The second thing, let's refine that a little bit. The vast majority of run-of-the-mill neuropathies are sensory predominant. So diabetic neuropathy, alcoholic neuropathy. Most neuropathies affect the sensory fibers more than the motor fibers. So the second thing is if you ever see a patient with a predominantly motor disorder, or if you see a patient with a pure motor disorder, that, that's, that's an indication to act quickly uh, and get that patient in for electrical testing to yeah. try to characterize. 